So I'm, I'm Kent Brown. I am, as she said, uh, co-founder and CTO of Modus Box. Uh, we are founded in Seattle, but we actually uh, kind of spread around the world. We've been at it about five years, and we specialize in interoperability, integration. Uh, specifically, we focus on no-code enterprise integration tools, specifically around B2B. So uh, when I say B2B integration, I usually put the word integration because B2B, most people think of like e-commerce sites, so businesses selling to each other. But B2B integration uh, has been around for years, and it's, it's basically things like orders, payments, shipments, those sort of things. So coordinating between companies when they're, when they're buying and selling. Um, so we'll get into this. If, if you know this, a lot of this stuff is old and clunky, and that's kind of the point of why, why we do this. Um, but really, B2B makes the world go round, right? It's boring, but it's so much of what you live and, and use and buy every day is handled by these kind of transactions. Um, one other quick point is that what we've gotten into a lot recently, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit, is for B2B, rather than saying business to business, there's another flavor that we call bank to bank. And so we, we're actually pretty big in the payment space, and so we're coordinating, helping smaller uh, financial institutions like banks or mobile money systems in Africa connect through payment hubs to really to help drive financial inclusion in Africa and Southeast Asia. So I'll mention that. So anyway, that's what B2B is. Um, so why am I talking about B2B at API? So that's the title, B, uh, B2B in an API-driven world. Um, this, this is a, a, a iteration on the quote from Mark Andreessen. They said that software is eating the world. He was explaining why, at the time he was on the board of HP, that was shifting from a lot of hardware to software. And it's it basically a general bullish statement that, yeah, software is growing, it's changing the world. Um, the same thing can be true said about APIs, right? APIs, really, that's what kind of the whole talk is. APIs are changing. Um, just kind of agreeing that, hey, REST is probably the best way to do this. Microservices have been around for a while. Um, is changing things, having integration at the heart. So every application is now integratable in a sense, whereas you know, several years ago you had, to, you had to actually go and apply that. So if APIs are so great, why don't we just use public APIs for B2B integration? <laughs> the answer is you should. So if you're starting B2B integration and you're able to do public APIs, those solve the same problems. Uh, but what happened was a bunch of smart guys, our fathers or grandfathers back in the late 70s, depending on how old you are, for me it'd be fathers, um, created what at the time they were just as excited about as we are now about APIs. It was called EDI, Electronic Data Integration, right? So it was a revolutionary idea that people don't have to fill out forms and take orders, that they could actually fill out screens and capture that data and send it back and forth between companies in these, these standard space formats. So in those days, standards were important. Everybody would get together and agree on what can be in it, but by the time they created the standard, it's so, it's so big and convoluted that it's actually hard to use. Um, they didn't have things like uh, XML and, and JSON, and so they had really weird comma-delimited, fixed-width kind of formats that are weird to look at. But at the, at the bottom line, they achieved a lot. They got this e-commerce going. Um, and so the, the reality is, although APIs are eating the world, there's still this plate of legacy to deal with, right? And so if you're an API developer, you're building your resume by building APIs, and someone says, hey, you need to do EDI, you're like this, this kid right here that, like me, had to eat his vegetables before he left the table. So. I'm going to kind of tell a story of, of what we've seen happen over and over and, and the problem we're trying to solve. So I'm saying APIs are from Mars, EDI is from Venus. And there's not intended to be any vendor, uh, gender implication here. You could have switched it around. You know, the point is that they're from different planets. Um, if you're doing EDI, uh, your, your developers that are, doing, that are doing APIs probably have no idea about EDI, and your people that do EDI, don't, they sort of know what APIs are. So, um, so let's say... I, I, I've, I'm a small startup. I'm starting to build up my, my product. I've got some kind of physical product that I sell, and I've got a, a retail channel. Let's say it's Walmart or Amazon or Mark, Marks and Spencers. Um, and so I say, hey, we've got our orders and all that. Our e-commerce site is good, but we want to start going through some of these big retail channels. So you get your dev, and he says, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to build an API that's going to solve all the problems. So he goes and works really hard, stands up in, you know, in inter, uh, Enterprise Integrator and API, and says, I am done. We're, we're good to go. Your 
B2B analyst who you've, who's done this before and you've hired to say, hey, okay, API is ready to go, go integrate with our partners. They say, API, I think I know what that is. I can spell it, but I, I really don't know, you know what you're talking about. I've never connected to an API. Um, can you do EDI? That's what I understand. And then, you know, he insists, no, APIs are changing the world, you've got to do it. So then the B2B analyst goes to the partner and says, hey, can you do our API? And he says, API, no, we're actually Walmart and we've got a standard and if you want to do business with this, this is what you do. It's this version of EDI, it's this connection, you do what we tell you to do, right? And so you as a small business have to do what they say. So he says, no, EDI. And so then they go back to the developer and say, actually, this API is not going to work. We've got to do EDI. And he says, EDI, I don't know what EDI is. I don't want to touch it, right? <laughs> um, so whenever you have people from different planets, anybody watch Star Trek, what was the answer to people from different planets and different languages being able to talk to each other? Um, they had a thing called the, the, tra the universal translator, right? And so that's, that's what you need, just like anything, and that's what ESBs do. Um, you need to stand in front and translate those two worlds. Um, so what, that's what we do. That's what Modusbox does. We fill that gap. And it's not just, the gap is not just formats. It's not just EDI versus, versus API. It's also asynchronous protocols versus synchronous. It's these people are very comfortable in code with Java or Node or, or whatever they're working in. Uh, these people are not. They're, they know a lot about the EDI domain. They know exactly what the rules are. They can even do some mapping, uh, sort of trans transformation work. But beyond that, they're not comfortable in an IDE. They don't know what you're talking about. They're not going to compile code. And so that's one of the gaps that, that we fill. We, that's why we, we developed the no-code uh, integration tool, so that they can configure what they want. We can have some very standard patterns that are implemented and tested, and they can get the job done. So just real quick, our product, the, the brand is Portex. There, there are several little products, but it's basically no code B2B gateway is really the right word. That's the thing to compare it to if you have an API gateway is standing there on the edge and helping you manage the security and, and the flow of data. Um, so we have an easy transaction designer where you can, and, and he, uh, Devong's going to demo in a few minutes. Um, you can set up what kind of transaction, how do I transform it, where does it go internally, and so I'm going to be able to, we're going to be able to translate from EDI world uh, into an API world. So on the back end, you would call that developer's API. The other side of this is the management of it. Rather than having to send somebody to look at log files and figure out what's happened, in the B2B world, when you get a message, it's kind of a uh, reliable delivery. You, you, you acknowledge back that you got the message, and you, don't need to, you really shouldn't come back later and say, oh, we dropped it, we didn't handle it right, can you resend the message? Um, so being able to persist those, be able to look at them, to be able to go in and see what happened and troubleshoot, maybe hit a replay button to say, okay, we got the message, we acknowledged it, but we, we fumbled somewhere, our system was down, our mapping was wrong, we want to retry it. So there's, those are just some classic uh, aspects of, that, of a full solution there, and so that, that monitoring and, and operation side is, is really important. So, so Portex does both of those. So just a to touch on the architecture, uh, there's a, I'll call them mini services. This was written three years ago and we thought we were doing microservices, but they're, they're not quite micro, they're mini. But we have basically a transaction monitor API and a partner configuration API. So, and then we have got those component screens in our, in our browser application. So I can go in and configure this. It's just storing data. It's not code or anything. It's just data that says, I expect this kind of message, I'm going to apply this kind of map, I'm going to send it here. And then we have, running in the ESP, we, have, we call it the, the routing engine, and it's basically an application written for a specific ESP which will you know, phone home and get the, the configuration, so when it gets a message of that type, it identifies it, applies the rules, and, and process, you know, translates and forwards it where it should go. Um, then in addition, when that's flowing, the, the routing engine is talking back to the, the monitoring so the user can go in and see exactly what happened we got successes, we got our acknowledgements, everything's good, or no, something happened, hit replay. So the reason we use an ESP, there's just a lot in there to handle all the connectors, to handle the threading, there's just a lot done. And so for us, ESP is kind of like our operating system. So just like the Java runtime, and this is, it's at a much higher level, but the comparison to Java, to, to write once and run anywhere, you have a JVM that you write in different operating systems, right? So we have, uh, routing engines that we run in different ESPs. When you're doing here, you're really just modeling. You're storing data, and then we can 
we can make that run on different uh, ESPs. So it kind of helps avoid vendor lock-in, um, and it helps us prevent from trying to write yet another ESP, which uh, there are a lot of really good ones. Um, and we also find that we partnering with a lot of the ESP vendors, B2B is not their priority. Their priority is more APIs, more modern things, right? And so we can come in and complement, provide a solution so that a customer that's hosting, they're comfortable hosting, let's say, micro integrator, um, and all your APIs, everything's there, you're very comfortable hosting it, we can put your B2B workload on the same runtime, basically. Okay, so open source is also eating the world. Um, Ten years ago, this was the, the, kind of the connection that I have with WSO2. I was at Microsoft, and I was in charge of WCF, which was their web service um, uh, SOAP you know, uh, framework. And so we did a joint project to show interoperability, and we did it at Apache, and that was really from uh, John Marsh and, and Paul Fremantle and, and um, Sanjeeva. So this was, a, <laughs> this was a skit we did. They have this lightning talk. And so the point of the skit was just to somehow engage, and people would get up and do something clever, like tell a poem or something about life in, in Apache and poke fun at it. And, and so we were poking fun at what it was like to be a Microsoft at the time, very non-open source company. We were asking for a Windows server, and that was just like the hardest thing in the world to get a Windows server to host our project. Um, just figuring out, we just felt out of place. We were like uh, from Mars and they were from Venus or something. Um, but now that's no longer true. If you go look, even Microsoft has come a long way and, and open source has proven its, its value. Big companies like Microsoft have embraced it. So it has come a, a long way. And so as um, people, me and my co-founder who left uh, Microsoft to be doing open source is actually really cool. And it's just kind of a different world than, than it was 10 years ago. Um, so we have a couple of really big ones. We have a, a, a system called Mojuloop, and it's a financial payments switch is the technical word for it. And it basically sits in between uh, banks, uh, as I said, mobile money, uh, microfinance, these kind of institutions in, in Africa. So we're, that's being funded, and we're, co we're working with the, the, um, with the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation. So that's really cool. It's all open source. It's intended to lower the fees really drive financial inclusion in Africa to give these kind of mobile money solutions where it's interoperable. If I get paid, let's say I'm on a street vendor, I'm selling something through, um, I get paid through my mobile money system, I can then send that to pay back my loan or, or pay a mortgage or health insurance or those kinds of things. Um, we also have a uh, data transformation engine that we've, we call it Data Sonnet. It's basically a, just a tweak on JSON, which is an open source. So uh, yeah, the point is we're, we're embracing open source. So, when we wanted to do a truly open source, we've, we've partnered with some other sort of more commercial uh, versions of ESPs, but we wanted a truly open source uh, ESP for hosting Port X, because again, when we go to those, those smaller banks in Africa, they can't afford the big expensive uh, EE and enterprise uh, solutions. And so WSO2, not to say it's not enterprise, but it's open source, we can, ha we can have an affordable cost model for them. So WSO2 is a natural choice. So effectively what we're doing is here is, is first talking about our, um, are releasing that and supporting that. So just being a B2B, a true easy uh, B2B solution, again, targeted for those EDI users, sit in well with your API strategy. So uh, that is pretty much, so we're building on, on uh, micro integrator, really happy with the work that's done there to make it lightweight and make it you know, more cloud native. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Devong. Who, Devong's a practice manager. He works with customers who are adopting our tools and doing B2B implementations. And so, hand it off. Okay. Hello all. So as Kent mentioned, typical B2B scenario is a supplier and a, a buyer. So in this case, we have a buyer called Big Retail and we are the home organization. Our organization is a supplier. So what happens is Big Retail sends a purchase order, which is X12850 for those who wants to be bored by EDI details. And then it gives it to Portex. Portex make, makes it easy. What it does is it gets the X12, it, apply, it passes the X12 into slightly more readable format so that your, your, your API or uh, your API developers can translate that over to the system API. And then uh, we call the system API using the uh, configuration. So that's the demo that we will be doing today. So to show you some of the configuration that we have right now, uh, let's say uh, into the relationship. 
Uh, in any B2B integration, whenever you are implementing those, there can be hundreds or even thousands of partners that you have to onboard or even maintain. So Portex is your go-to uh, place where you can easily do that without much effort and uh, save you lots of time and effort to do that. So in, in this uh, particular implementation, we'll be looking at the relationship between uh, WSU2 demo, B2B, which is our home organization, and is a supplier, and the big retail is a buyer. So we'll go into the, that relationship. Uh, in here, we can maintain the identifiers and certificates that comes with B2B. So if you are familiar with uh, X12 or Edifact, there are specific uh, identifiers that you have to provide in case of X12. Those are ISAs, GS, and all that. So uh, you can specify. Now, as you mentioned, you were looking for the security settings and all that. So if you are using AS2, you can maintain your certificates on the port X2. Without this, it becomes really difficult to manage and maintain all the certs uh, and other stuff at one particular place. You can also do X12 configuration or add effect or any other format that you have, we are using in uh, B2B. That configuration that involves the uh, separators and partner specific uh, uh, spaces. So before I go into more detail, let me go into the endpoints. So we definitely support HTTP because that's what you use to integrate with your internal API, but we also support uh, the B2P specific ones such as AS2, as you mentioned. Uh, FTP, SFTP are the more standard ones that I've seen with my customers. That's what they use mostly for their uh, any integrations. So uh, that's uh, some of them which I have uh, configured. And now let's go and implement the transactions, uh, one typical B2B transaction that we have. So here uh, we'll be doing, This is a typical eight, uh, transaction where we receive an 850, which is purchase order uh, from your partner. Uh, what we do is we apply a transformation. So if I go into slightly more detail, here we have uploaded a data sonnet script. So if I want to get, take a look at that, it looks a lot better. If you have worked with XSLT, which is a nightmare, I don't know why you want to use that. This will save you lots of time and effort. It is much more intuitive to work with. So uh, you upload your data sonnet script, and then specify that you will be converting that to the API format. So at this moment, well, what you have done is you have translated your X12 into something that is understandable by the systems and by the mappers in JSON format, and then you are applying a transformation to your API format. And once that is done, you are saying, yeah, now I want to call a particular endpoint which is right now HTTP. If you are sending to your partner, the endpoint can be any of those uh, B2B specific ones that we talked about, okay? So this is how uh, our transaction is. Now, before I go and execute one of the transactions, what I, I would like to show you that we have the routing engine that Kent mentioned earlier is running right now in the WSO2 micro integrator. Uh, I have that application running, uh, which is here, and uh, I'm gonna make a call. For the sake of this demo, I'll be using HTTP. Now, this is a typical EDI. As you can see, it doesn't make much sense if you are an API developer or if you are a developer. It gets confusing even. Unless you are an EDI analyst, it won't make much sense. We'll be showing how it gets easier and how then your developers or line of business developers can work with that. So I'm gonna initiate a request. And now that it's done, let's go back to our uh, portal and then do the tracking. Okay. <clears throat> so we, we can see the messages are processing and whoa. all right. So we receive a message. The Portex has ability to persist. So we, I can go ahead and look at the data that was persisted. I see that, okay, here is my X12, which is not good. Then again, once it gets uh, more down the line, now you'll be see, okay, it was not very readable for the typical user. Now we have translated to a more readable format, which is uh, from the, uh, our own parser in, in JSON. A line of the business API developer can make sense of that, not the system API developer. So now for them, we have again translated to the API format, which has already been exposed, which is part of your API. And that's your ultimate uh, API format. And now that I have converted that and I've, I see that I've sent to the HTTP. 
So with this, you can always track your messages that are getting transferred. As Kent mentioned, you can do reprocessing and other stuff too.